The Chinese state-run media is expanding its reach across the globe, while one group is putting a stop to its ambitions. A new push for a harder stance against the Chinese Communist Party. It comes as a sweeping bill that's just been approved by a U.S. Senate committee. An 11-year-old girl in China is begging for help. She says authorities have forcibly destroyed her home. And a car bomb at a hotel in Pakistan kills four people. It's the same hotel where the Chinese ambassador to Pakistan stayed. The building is home to billions of UK, Canada, Australia and Taiwan, among others. Don Ma, NTD News. Chinese state-run media CGTN has expanded its operations to a wide range of countries across the globe in recent years. But one group has been successful at stopping that expansion. NTD's Penny Jo has the story. A TV provider in Norway says it will stop airing Chinese Communist Party or CCP mouthpiece CGTN. That's because the channel continues to broadcast forced TV confessions. CGTN is also known as CCTV in China. Other countries, including the UK, Australia and Sweden, are also taking CGTN off the air. In February, CGTN lost its broadcasting license in the UK. Soon after, British broadcasting regulators fined CGTN over $300,000 for airing forced confessions and biased coverage of pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. Who is the driving force behind this anti-CCP media campaign? Spain-based human rights group Safeguard Defenders, they have been filing complaints against CGTN in multiple countries since 2018. Their group's director, Peter Dahlin, is using his first-hand accounts to convince broadcasting regulators to get CGTN off the air. Dahlin himself has been a victim of CGTN's forced TV confessions. In 2016, the Chinese regime detained him and forced him to own up to crimes he didn't commit, what the regime called endangering state security. He was forced to say on camera that he violated Chinese laws and hurt the Chinese people and the communist regime. Back then, Dalin ran a non-governmental organization helping Chinese rights lawyers. After detaining Dalin in an isolation cell for three weeks, Chinese authorities interrogated him for days. Sometimes Dalin would hear someone yelling upstairs while being physically abused. Later on, he learned that it was his colleague detained in a separate cell. He couldn't seek legal counsel or take medications. Dalin says the regime also detained his girlfriend in order to force him to confess. This despite his girlfriend not being involved with his work. And because the fact that I was a foreigner, I was treated a lot better than most other victims that I know of. Uh, I didn't suffer physical torture, for example. Most victims do. He was then forced to plead guilty in front of CCTV cameras without going through any trial. The journalist was given the same paper I had, and we just acted it out like a theater production. She read the questions, I read the answers, and we had a dozen agents of the Ministry of State Security standing around us in a half circle, constantly intervening. They speak slower, look sadder, look happier, uh, change the emphasis. In how the Chinese regime has also forced other foreigners to, to confess on TV. They, including a British citizen, a Hong Kong bookstore owner with Swedish citizenship, an employee at the British consulate in Hong Kong, just to name a few. The CCP has also used it on targeted groups, including rights lawyers, activists, dissidents, faith groups, and ethnic minorities. The broadcasts that are primarily domestic for a Chinese audience tend to focus on, as I say, as a tool of political terror against certain groups of people that they feel are not obeying the party line. Several CCP-controlled media outlets accuse Dalin of threatening China's national security. Dalin responds, I welcome it. I think the more they speak, the better for the world, because it's easier for us to realize what they are. Uh, so yeah, it's a, a badge of honor, really. Dalin says Beijing doesn't have much leverage to retaliate or stop his efforts. But as can be seen from the outcome in the UK, uh, the CCP is powerless really to strike back uh, because they already have such tight limitations on foreign media in China. Dalin says the CCP used the same strategy during the pandemic. In the beginning of the COVID-19 or coronavirus crisis, there was a raft of these confessions appearing where people were forced to, to take back, hadn't spoken about the virus in a way that the party did not like. 
Government agencies in the U.S., Canada, and France are now investigating CGTN following Dahlin's complaints. In March, France approved CGTN's broadcasting license, but France's broadcast regulator is investigating CGTN for violating media law. It alleges that CGTN forced a 10-year-old Uyghur girl to denounce her father in an interview. U.S.-based China affairs analyst Tang Jingyuan believes these countries are being a role model for others. It's not enough to simply condemn the CCP's public opinion war and information war verbally. You have to take concrete actions. Safeguard Defenders says CGTM may hear more bad news in the coming months. A sweeping bill to counter China has just been approved by a U.S. Senate committee. On Wednesday, the Strategic Competition Act of 2021 received overwhelming support from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Members voted 21 to 1 in favor of the action. The bill will now move on to the full Senate vote. The push for a harder stance against the Chinese regime is one of few bipartisan sentiments Congress seems to agree on. China's foreign ministry said last week that Beijing firmly opposed the bill. Spanning nearly 300 pages, the legislation details comprehensive methods for countering communist China. Tactics include cybersecurity, diplomatic strategy and military deployment. The move also seeks to curb China's predatory economic behavior, like currency manipulation and Chinese investment programs known to trap developing nations in debt. Amid China's rising assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region, the bill stresses the need to prioritize U.S. military investment there. It recommends nearly $1 billion in funding for Indo-Pacific-related military programs. The bipartisan bill recognizes China as a threat. It reads, it is now clear that the PRC China has chosen to pursue state-led mercantilist economic policies, an increasingly authoritarian governance model at home, an aggressive and assertive foreign policy. Among the bill's last-minute amendments, a proposal to boycott the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics was also approved. Though ambitious, the bill is seen by some only as a positive first step toward meeting the China challenge. A Chinese researcher is receiving a 33-month jail sentence for trying to steal trade secrets from a U.S. hospital. His goal was to sell them in China. Last December, Zhou Yu pleaded guilty to stealing five trade secrets from a children's hospital in Ohio. The 51-year-old worked there for 10 years until 2017. Zhou conspired with his wife Chen Li. She also worked at the institute as a researcher. In February, Chen was sentenced to 30 months in jail for her role in the scheme, after also pleading guilty. According to court documents, the couple started a company in China. They used stolen trade secrets from the U.S. to create and sell exosome kits there. Exosomes are small bags of fluid released from cells. Researchers are using them to treat diseases. U.S. prosecutors say the couple also received funding from Chinese authorities. A U.S. Justice Department official says in a statement that Beijing's programs encourage Joe's greed to steal. The department says the couple will have to pay over $4 million in compensation and penalty. Dozens of Chinese researchers were sentenced for stealing U.S. intellectual property in recent years. The U.S. Justice Department says around 60 percent of all trade secret theft cases involve communist China. A U.S.-based professor is facing three criminal charges for hiding funding from the Chinese regime. He has yet to plead guilty. Math professor Ming Qingxiao is from Southern Illinois University Carbondale. On Wednesday, the U.S. Justice Department, or DOJ, charged him with two counts of wire fraud and one count of making a false statement. This comes after Xiao allegedly concealed his ties to the Chinese communist regime while applying for U.S. taxpayer funding. The DOJ says Xiao received a research grant from the Chinese regime in Guangdong province. Xiao was also on the payroll of a state-run university in China. He had committed to teaching and doing research there from 2018 to 2023. Despite this, Xiao applied for U.S. taxpayer-funded research grants. In his application, he was supposed to disclose all his ties to foreign governments and schools. But Xiao failed to do so. He then received over $150,000 from the National Science Foundation. Xiao got his Ph.D. degree from a U.S. college in 1997. He is set to appear in court on May 13th. 
Video sharing app TikTok could face a damages claim worth billions. They are alleged to have illegally collected private data from millions of children in the UK. A lawsuit is launched in Britain against TikTok and its Chinese parent company ByteDance. The former Children's Commissioner for England, Anne Longfield, has launched a legal claim against TikTok and its Chinese parent company ByteDance. She is making the claim on behalf of 3.5 million children in the UK aged under 13. Longfield alleges that every child that has used TikTok since May 2018 may have had their private personal information illegally collected by TikTok. In May 2018, the General Data Protection Regulation was introduced to give better protection for people's privacy. The legal claim argues that TikTok and ByteDance breached data protection rules by willfully taking children's personal information without sufficient warning, transparency, or the necessary consent required by law, meaning parents and children don't know what is being done with their private information. The claim calls for compensation for the millions of potentially affected children, which is said could run into billions of pounds. TikTok's policy in the UK do not allow children under 13 to use the app, and those downloading it are asked to input their age when they sign up. But figures suggest that many under-13s use the platform. Although TikTok's policy on data collection is listed on its website, Ms Longfield says she feels TikTok's practices are hidden and shady. The app asks for children's name, address, date of birth, their likes, interests and habits. Longfield says you shouldn't be doing that when it's kids. In response to the action, TikTok says, it has robust policies in place to protect all users, and teenage users in particular. They say they will vigorously defend the action. TikTok is one of the world's most popular apps, especially among young people, and has around 100 million users in Europe alone. As of January, TikTok has about 700 million monthly active users worldwide. This according to the latest TikTok statistics. Last year, the Trump administration ordered the company to be sold to an American company, citing national security concerns. If the deal fails, the app would be banned. The Trump administration accused TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, of being a mouthpiece for the CCP. But multiple legal cases held up the deal. The Biden administration paused legal actions against TikTok shortly after taking office, meaning TikTok can continue to operate in the U.S. An 11-year-old girl in China is begging for help from CCP head Xi Jinping. She says authorities have forcibly demolished her home. But is asking Xi Jinping really going to get her the help she needs? NTD's Yi Ru has the details. The video of an 11-year-old girl asking Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping for help is going viral online. In the video, the girl cried and said her home was demolished and her entire family has been homeless for years. But many people doubt that she will help her. Yuan Yuxuan is from a town in northwest China's Shanxi province. She said her family had a storefront home. In 2010, authorities started to demolish the village where her family lived in order to use the land for more profitable projects. The standard price for her house at the time was over $70 per square foot, but authorities offered Yuan's family only about one-tenth of the price as compensation. Since her parents did not consent to the deal, authorities later forcibly demolished their house. On June 12, 2012, hundreds of people from the court, the local government, the Public Security Bureau pried open our house. They pushed and carried out our family members and demolished our house. Everything in the house was buried in ruins. It's been eight years since we lost our land and our house. Our entire family is homeless and has to drift about. She asked Xi for help, citing Xi's speech on China being a country with the rule of law. But Chinese human rights activist Dong Guangping believes it is useless to talk to the Communist Party about the rule of law, because the CCP has never ruled by law. Your property is not yours. Even your life doesn't belong to you. The Communist Party is relying on land sales to make money and then keep the regime running with this money. One Chinese netizen also points out it might even be worse if she gets involved. As soon as Grandpa Xi comes, you will have a place to live, a psychiatric hospital or a detention center. 
Forced demolitions have created millions of victims across all walks of life in China. A small part of them are vocal about it and have been brutally persecuted for decades. Take Jia Ling Min, for example. She was a teacher in central China's Henan province. After her house was demolished, she taught herself law to defend her own rights and the rights of others with the same fate. In the end, authorities sentenced her to four years in prison for what they called picking quarrels and provoking troubles. Another example is Beijing lawyer Ni Yulan. She was sentenced to one year in prison after she defended her rights when her home got forcibly demolished. She was beaten in prison so badly that her legs became crippled. Iru, NTD News. New Chinese military action is causing more tension in the Taiwan Strait. Taiwanese fishermen recently witnessed a Chinese warship crossing over the median line of the Taiwan Strait and entering Taiwanese waters. Taiwan's defense spokesperson says the island is closely monitoring the situation, adding that whether Beijing intrudes at sea or by air, Taiwan is ready to take appropriate actions. The strait separates democratic Taiwan from communist-ruled mainland China. The U.S. drew a line down the middle of the strait when it signed a treaty with Taiwan decades ago. The line marks a buffer zone between Taiwan and mainland China, though Beijing doesn't recognize it. The Chinese regime considers Taiwan and its surrounding waters part of its territory. The warship incident is the first time this year that a Chinese warship has crossed the median line. But Chinese bombers and fighters have repeatedly entered the same area by air in the past few months. At the same time, Taiwan has been taking steps to protect itself. The newspaper Taiwan News says the White House is preparing its first arms sale to Taiwan since Biden's inauguration. By law, the U.S. maintains a commitment to selling arms to Taiwan. That's so the island can defend itself in case of war with Beijing. A car bomb blast in a hotel in Pakistan killed four people on Wednesday. This hotel is where the Chinese ambassador to Pakistan stayed. Libby Hogan reports. A car bomb ripped through a luxury hotel car park in the Pakistani city of Quetta on Wednesday. The blast killed four people and wounded 11. China's ambassador to Pakistan was staying at the Serena Hotel, but authorities say he was not there when the bomb exploded. The Pakistan Taliban claimed responsibility for the bombing. A spokesman for the militant group wrote in a text message to Reuters that a suicide bomber carried out the attack with a car full of explosives. But it was not clear if the Chinese envoy was the target of the attack. The Chinese embassy did not respond to a request for comment. Quetta is the capital of Baluchistan province bordering Iran and Afghanistan. It's also home to the newly expanded Gwadar Deepwater Port that is key to a planned $65 billion investment in China's Belt and Road Initiative. Chinese nationals and their interests in the region have been attacked before by Taliban militants and nationalist insurgents. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.